Welcome to the future. It's a new year and it's going to be a new you. I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last couple of episodes, we've been talking a lot about passive income or knowledge products. Well, in keeping with this, this theme, we're going to be talking to Dustin Lee today. He's going to talk all about passive income for designers. Let's go to my slide. I'm going to introduce you in case you don't know who he is. I'm pretty sure you've seen his work. And I'll tell you where you're going to see it in a second. His name is Dustin Lee. He runs two companies. One is called the Retro Supply Company. He's the founder of it. And it was started in 2013 when he was $30,000 in debt. He's created now over 100 products and made over a million dollars in sales. Woo! That's a lot of moolah. That's a lot of dough, man. That is. Pocket uh, full of dough. It's pocket full. It's more than a pocket full of dough. That's a wheelbarrow <laughs> of dough, man. And he's also one part of the Honest Designers podcast. I like the way that sounds. We are the Dishonest Future podcast, but the Honest Designers podcast is where you want to get legitimate information from honest designers. He also runs the Passive Income for Designers website. Woo! That's a ma massive mouthful, PassiveIncomeForDesigners.com. Here's some of the work. Where I first saw your work was on Creative Market. And once I found Creative Market, I was thinking, oh my God, how are people making a living off selling five, twenty, forty-five dollar products? And I was just scratching my head thinking, I've spent too much time making these things. My time is better spent buying this. And when I introduced it to my wife, she was coming to the same conclusion. Like, how do people make money making these things? It's incredible. Well, it turns out somebody, somebody we're gonna talk to today is making a ton of money doing this. <laughs> Brushes, patterns, textures. Fonts, anything, drawings, I don't know, anything and everything he could make, he's making right now. He's gonna talk about how to do that. Check this out. This is pretty cool. So if you wanna go from a generic EPS like vector file and you wanna add some cool texture to it, look at this. And it amazes me, a lot of the tools that you make, Dustin, are in or for Illustrator. And they're really cool effects, yeah. right? That's a very Illustrator is a very popular um, category for us. Yeah. And so, Greg, I think when we were looking for halftone patterns and trying to make something look retro, he's like, oh, check this out. And there we are. So here's the second point of contact with you, Dustin, which was I had Diane Gibbs on my podcast, and she's part of our pro group, pro community. And she was like, you need to get him on your show, Dustin Lee. I'm like, Dustin Lee? A brother from another mother? And then I looked <laughs> you up and I'm like, wait a minute, he's white. And his name is Dustin Lee. I got to talk to this guy. So I'm glad that Greg actually was the one who wrangled you in on the show. So it's just kind of crazy that here we are talking to you, looking at your work. This is pretty dope. I mean, it's cool that he's sharing his work, but it's even cooler he's giving you his tools. Well, not quite giving it to you, but he's giving access to his tools to you. It's got a really cool style and a vibe. I love this style. I really do. And something else I know about you is you're, you're hanging out in Vancouver, Washington, just right kind of next door to Portland, Oregon. So when I was out there, people referred to it as Upper Left USA. So... Here we go. <laughs> Today's show, he promises to share some secrets to selling more products on creative market. Like, how did he do it? And how to choose a niche? This is some of the hardest things or decisions you're going to have to make as a creator. Like, where do you begin? What area should you go down? Isn't everything already covered? And we're hopefully going to dive a little deeper into seven ways to make a passive income product fast. Woo, that's a mouthful for me. You guys, please help me welcome Dustin Lee to the show. Yeah! Woo! Yes, you got it <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Just got done with the run, feeling good, and I'm I'm seriously so excited to be on. I like I was telling you, I've heard your voice so much, seeing you. It's so fun to actually talk to you. <laughs> and here we are in 2019 talking to each other. Dustin warned us before today is trash day, so we might hear the garbage truck out back. But I guarantee you. It's all gold today. There's no garbage on this show at all. So why don't we do this? I hear that you have a presentation. It'll take about 15 or 20 minutes or so. Take as much time as you want. Why don't you go ahead and share your screen and tell us a little bit. Enlighten us, if you will. And you guys that are tuning in live on YouTube, start sending us your comments and questions. Greg Gunn and Jonah and I are going to be monitoring that, and we'll pick up those questions when it makes sense. So the mic is yours. Okay, cool. Well, because I'm horrible at time, I'm... I, I can be a talker. I have this fantastic thing. It's from a site called Time Timer, I believe it's called. Okay. Um, anyways, it's visual for my kids, but I'm a kid myself, kind of. So I'm gonna put the timer for that long. Nice. I'm keep myself on schedule. There's no real schedule. Uh, you can take as long as you want, man. 
Okay, We're here to well, soak up the knowledge. Okay, cool. I'll keep it just in case. You, okay. You, you never know. Yeah. But okay. Um, so right now, can you guys see my presentation? Yes, it's a little cropped on my screen. Is it yeah, cropped for you I guys? In for can you unzoom? Yeah. Yeah. You zoomed in because you thought he was going to not go full screen? Yes. Yeah, he, now he's giving us the full Monty. I also want to say hello to the 460 people that are watching. Woo! Welcome, you guys. Hey guys. You have a lot of fans. Thanks for showing up. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for, for showing up, everybody. Um, yeah, so um, well, what I'm going to start with is I'm just going to talk to you about how to build a passive income with your creative skills. I've you know, done this for myself. Before that, I worked in um, graphic design and online marketing. I've done conferences, workshops, and over the course of doing that, um, you start to hear the same questions over and over again. Those questions being, uh, how do you know what product to make? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you get traffic to your product, and how do you like maximize the amount of money you make off of it? Are essentially like the questions you hear over and over again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story uh, because I, I I really believe that anyone who's telling you how to do anything should have done it themselves. So I want to kind of establish some authority or credibility mm -hmm. and get you guys excited about the idea, and then we'll go into each of those things, um, and then I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to chatting with everybody. So um, to get started. Um, throughout my 20s, I struggled to create a, a business that let me be creative and make good money. I originally went to an art school and then I became a banker because I figured I need to learn business to make money as an artist. And I just tried a lot of stuff and failed. I could tell you a lot of just like nightmarish stories um, about uh, places I worked. But uh, hold on a second. Let me, I have this little thing on here. Let's see if I can pass it out. Okay, so finally, when I was when I was around like 27, 28, I had a, a unique combination of circumstances that presented themselves, and and what that was was, I, I'm guessing a lot of you guys listening are familiar with uh, Tim Ferriss. Are you guys mm -hmm. familiar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So so like a lot of people, I had read that book. I had read books by Jonathan Fields and um, a variety of other people, and I was really into the idea of blogging and making money online, and I was also into the idea of design, and I was doing design work. And I had randomly written to one of my heroes who owned a site called uh, Pay to Exist. And the, and the guy that owned it was named Jonathan Mead. And uh, I said, you know, I'll do work for free for you. I would just love to work for you. Uh, and a year after I had written him that email, he responded to me and said, hey, do you still want to do that? And I said, absolutely. And uh, I did a project and I ended up getting hired to work for him full time. And it was a big decision. I couldn't decide if I should do it or not. And it ended up being the best decision I ever made. And the reason was because I was completely upside down on how to make money online uh, selling your creative skills. And I think that's something that a lot of creatives struggle with is you know how to make great looking stuff. You know how to make stuff for clients, but you just don't know how to stop trading time for money and actually mm -hmm. convert your creative skills into cash. And when I worked with him for 18 months, I learned all of those tricks, um, all about marketing, all about sales funnels, all about how to build trust with an audience um, when you're trying to sell them something. And that was perfect timing because a point came when my wife and I were um, expecting, or I guess more accurately you should say, we were not expecting our first child <laughs> and we were totally broke. Um, and I just panicked. I was in panic mode. And if I'm honest with you guys, I was I was drinking too much. I was scared to death. I was in thirty thousand dollars and some change debt. I didn't know what to do. And I was working on a startup. And I was living living down. Uh, we were just saying that we were both from the San Jose area. I was living down in Mountain View. Mm -hmm. And I realized I needed to make some money. But I was already working for this startup and I was making next to nothing, nothing trying to get this startup going. So I said, how am I going to make money with just a few hours a day of extra time? So I started getting up early and making products for creative market. It was totally random. There was no particular reason I picked creative market other than it was low hanging fruit to attempt desperately um, in all honesty to make diaper money, to save face mm. because I was making no money when this mm. baby came. Well, it wasn't a good situation. Uh, and so I started making products and, um, Surprisingly, um, here's me before. This is like literally me in the coffee shop where I first started this business. And 
I made over $10,000 in three months. I wow. like, like literally could not believe that I had made $10,000 doing this. Uh, my first product was a set of logos. Wasn't the most sexy product. Uh, and then I went on to just make other things and experiment. And I used the ideas that I had learned from working in the online marketing world and I mixed it with design. Uh, and in the first three months, I'd made $10,000. You can see here, here's way back in the day when that first happened. Um, I can't stress to you how exciting this was to me. I mean, imagine, imagine on Friday going out to Thai food with your wife and Sunday wondering if you can pay the car bill because you don't have enough money in your checking account. So mm -hmm. have $11,000 come into my account um, in a month was, uh, I don't know, I, I felt like I was set for life. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a big change. Yeah, it, it was drastic and um, it was exciting and exhilarating. And obviously that was positive reinforcement to um, continue to try to hone this. So this was around four or five years ago when this happened. Um, and then I just kept applying the skills that I had learned from online marketing. Um, and that included building an email list that included learning about copywriting that included listening to customers and really finding out exactly what they wanted, what they struggled with, what were their trigger points that got them excited about a product and making great products. I mean, when it, when it comes down to it, I'm sure, you know, you guys know, you guys make a fantastic podcast, you know, not, nothing succeeds no matter how well you market it, unless you're just making something really great for a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, like here, I don't want to show some screenshots now. So like here's screenshots now. These are just off my phone that I had taken um, just this, this year. Um, wow. So you can see this is legit. It's not like I had a, a string of luck for one month. Um, day after day, week after week, month after month, um, the business has thrived. Um, Hold on a second here. And you can Hold, go, go back there. My eyesight's not so good because the monitor that I'm looking at is really far away. And, and I know Jonah's reaction is like, wow. What, what are the numbers? Oh, 4,000, 12,000, and 61.53 month. thousand. Oh, what is this? Is this a month? So to, yeah, the first one. So the first screenshot is a day. I a had day. 4,000 this particular day. Wow, okay. not, not all days are like that. Not right. all days. Um, th then a week, I had done 12. I see. And then in a month, I had done hmm. 61,000 this wow. particular month. It's still wow. <laughs> it's right. It's like that back yeah. song. Wow. And, and to be clear, like this mm -hmm. isn't isn't to brag about it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I've been able to build a business. But the, the point is that this started with seven logos in a pack when I was struggling. Mm -hmm. And the point is, I'm not a, I'm not a genius. I, I just applied these certain things and mixed them. And as I as I went to conferences and I got to meet other designers, I realized how many designers are struggling because they're just not mixing like fundamental marketing things with what they're doing. Um, so I put this in for fun because this is really one of the, one of the funnest parts of this. You get notifications on your phone telling you that money is coming in. Oh, I, love I remember that. I the, love that. <laughs> I remember the first day that I went when, when the business was first starting and it was just starting to pick up steam and I went to target and my baby had just been born. And by the way, we were broke when the baby was on its way. By the time it was born, we paid off all our debt and we were able to really enjoy having our, our Holy daughter, smokes. That's good and, progress, man. You hustle fast. Yeah, well, I mean, I had, I had, you know, eight months or whatever it was from mm -hmm. the time I found out. And um, I remember going to Target to buy like baby formula. And I think I bought her a couple of toys. And I remember walking out of the Target and I had made more money than I had spent while I was in Target. <laughs> <laughs> this is mind blowing. Like, we're all like, we've all, been, like, we've all lived off ramen. We've all like been in debt. We've all had been in this situation. So to be in a situation where I walked out of Target with more than I walked in with, um, I mean, just because of the show, like, an hour in Target, I remember five years later. Um, so anyways, here's screenshots of some sales from- Was that in 2013? Like what? Is that 2013 we're talking about here? These pictures right here? No, no, like this this pregnancy Target, like where you spend money and you walk out with more money than you, you spent? Yeah, and I don't mean like thousands more. I just mean like I basically- It doesn't matter. It's, it's $5 more, it's still good. Hell yeah. Right, you spend <laughs> yeah, money yeah, and yeah, then you still have more money in your, your pocket afterwards. That's pretty cool. All right. Yeah. Okay. It's 2013. Um, okay. I'm just trying to timeline this thing in my mind. All right. Keep going. Yeah. And so this is just like November that just happened. Yeah. Um, and of course, 
we, there's some stuff on passive income for designers where I've been taking these screenshots. I don't just take them for my own personal enjoyment to, to look at randomly. <laughs> you, you should know? make a wallpaper out of this. <laughs> right. What are you talking about? I'd frame that. <laughs> Um, so this is after, um, we were able, I mean, we were able to, um, go from being completely broke to there's my little girl. We were able to travel to Italy and rent an apartment for 45 days and just travel around and see things. I mean, I never thought I was going to leave the United States. My mom and dad never left, um, you know, the West coast essentially. Mm -hmm. It was life changing for me. Um, and, and this isn't even really like the amazing part. The amazing part is just day to day doing something you're excited about getting to make things that people love and not worrying about, am I going to be able to pay my bills next, next month? Mm -hmm. um, basically I get to do less stuff. I hate. <laughs> That's cool. That's Bottom a good line, line, right? Yes. Um, so there's three things I want to, I want to talk about. And these are just like three fundamental um, high level things that you can do to get started doing this. Um, like I said, you don't have to be a design celebrity. You don't have to have, very special credentials to do this. Um, it's basic things and really more than anything. And um, I, I would be curious if you agree with me on this. A lot of times this kind of thing is really just sticking to it, trying new things. Um, so here's the, the three step process. If you want to sham out a little bit and turn it into a process. <laughs> how to do this. Um, you guys get that reference, right? Sham wild this. All right. So we, we want to choose the right product. We want to make a product that stands out. Like you said, you made a very good point about creative market. How are you going to stand out in creative market? There's so many different things on there. There's like 20,000 shops. How on earth are you going to even capture any of that market share? Mm -hmm. um, and then find something you love about marketing, which I find is something that a lot of people have a, a hard time actually swallowing. Um, so we'll just dig into this here. Let's do it. So one is to choose the right product. So there's three questions to find a profitable product. Um, first of all, very obvious. What's popular on creative market? What's popular on Instagram? What's popular on design blogs? What do you have the skills to build well? Um, and where do you have leverage? So I'll kind of briefly go over these. So like what's popular in creative market? In my case, it was, I was thinking more of Dribbble. I remember going on Dribbble. Um, do you guys, you guys go on Dribbble pretty frequently? I'm more of a Behance person myself. I don't go and dribble much. Yeah, I spend okay. most time on Instagram, I think. Yeah, Instagram okay, and Behance, yeah. yeah. But I know a lot of designers on dribble. Okay, cool. Yeah, so Instagram is kind of becoming like the dribble. I guess they both kind of have their space. But mm -hmm. I was going on a dribble, and I would keep seeing people doing this great work. And then, you know, they'd be like, great work, someone would comment. And someone else would say, thanks, man. I'm like, I appreciate it. And then someone else would say, how did you get that texture? Radio silence. Mm. How did, what font are you using? Radio silence. Mm. And I kind of just decided I'm going to make a business where I'm going to answer all those questions and I'm going to answer them by making a product that answers the question. If that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I just figured, well, if people are asking this question, then there's probably people that are willing to pay for it because I'll pay for the answer. Mm -hmm. So why don't I just find the answer and sell the answer? Um, the second thing is you have to be honest with yourself. Like, what do you have the skills to build well? Uh, I, you, you really can't just choose a, a niche, in my opinion, and decide that that's what, and what you're going to sell. You have to really know what am I good at and what am I not good at? Um, and I think one of, one of my strengths has been that I've been able to realize what I'm not good at and find other people to help me and partner with me as opposed to deciding I need to go study for two years before I can move my business forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, where do you have leverage? This is super important because this comes down to traffic. So think about the things where you have leverage. So for instance, if someone is friends with you, they might have leverage to a larger audience. Um, by both of us knowing Diane Gibbs and, and me having a story that's relevant to your audience, I had some leverage to be on your show, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And that puts me in front of other people that I can share information with. Mm -hmm. And hey, like either that turns into friendships, that turns into connections, that might turn into some sales, um, that might turn into invites to do different things. So you have to think about where is your leverage? Do you um, work somewhere where you where it's high profile and you can use that to your advantage to show uh, credibility. Um, do you know people in a certain group that can spread the word about what you're making? The whole point here is that people need to be able to find you and you need to use every asset available to you 
to get people to find you. Um, it's like they, if they build it, they will come is like not non-existent. It's like, it's not a plan. It's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's a hope. Um, and then how can you re- reposition an existing product for a new audience? Um, it's kind of like, like a little bonus thing I have going on here. And what do you buy and enjoy? This is like a, an important one because when you buy something and enjoy it, it's easier to understand the psychology of why people buy things in the first place. Mm-hmm. So uh, as an example of this, um, here's something that we may call the mid-century Procreate brush pack. It's 15 Procreate brushes. Um, so how, how do we make this, how do we choose this product? Well, we knew Procreate was popular. Um, we knew that from having retro supply for a while, we know that people are interested in, in creating retro illustrations and stuff. And here's some other images from it. And we stood out by just like going above and beyond. I am a I'm friends with a illustrator who's done children's books and children's museums named Brad Woodard, done a lot of amazing stuff. And I said, Hey, what if we made this pack of 15 brushes that were the be all end all of brushes that you would need for procreate if you want to do this kind of illustration. And we spent, I don't know, probably 40, 50, 60 hours where we would just go back and forth on Skype. I'd make brushes. He'd try them out um, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually we had like a hundred brushes. And then like, we just like chiseled that down to 15. What are the 15 highest leverage brushes that we can make? Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess the point was we tried to do things that made people go, whoa, that's crazy. I can't believe they went to the extent of doing that. And if you can't make people feel that way, it's very hard to sell to them. Even even at $15, you have to make it feel like a no-brainer and they have to feel like they're probably getting three to five times the value of what you're charging. Um, so step two is to make products for your people. So how do you find your people? And, and the reason I say this is because if you're making products for people that you don't care about, it's really hard to get excited and get like fall in love with it. Um, so you could start by asking yourself, who is most definitely not my people? You know, think about the people that you would not be excited to make stuff for. Sometimes it's easier when you define it that way. Who am I not, who, who don't I want to make stuff for? And that will tell you who you do want to make stuff for. Um, Ask yourself, who do you follow on social media? Who do you always look out for their for their work? I love Andy J. Pizza. I'm always looking out for his work. He's someone that I make stuff for. I don't think he buys my stuff, but I kind of make it thinking, I hope Andy J. Pizza would like this. Um, That's a cool strategy. Who do you res- I like that. Yeah, for sure. And, it, and you know what I mean? Like it narrows it down to a very specific person. So you can kind of like imagine, oh, man, I think this person would really dig this. Um, and who do you respect in your field? So for me, I'm not the greatest illustrator, but I also like you, you mentioned something I think that is very, it was a very great point that I don't want to go to the trouble of making this. It's not that you couldn't make the procreate brushes. It's not that you couldn't make the textures. It's that you have better things to do. You have better things to do with your billable hours than spend four hours making textures for the client. Um, so I said, who do I respect in my field and how can I do the dirty work for them to save them time? Because I can't out draw a lot of my heroes. Um, and if you make stuff for everyone, you're kind of making stuff for no one. That's a, a bit of a cliche, but it's absolutely true. Right. So here's an example. This is a, an amazing artist named Edville. He lives in Mexico City. Super talented dude. Um, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. And I love his work. And it turns out he's just really enthusiastic about the products. Here's some of his work. Um, and this uses our products. It's no surprise that that he likes our products because we quite literally built products thinking about people exactly like him. Um, So I think knowing truly who a real living, walking, breathing person is that's going to use your product is huge. Right. Um, Before you go on, before you go on, I want to say something about that. Seth Godin was talking about this. He said, there's no such thing as writer's block or creative block. Cause he said the problem when people say that is because they don't know who they're talking to. So that you never get speakers block because when you're having a conversation with someone, you know how to talk to them. So I think you made several points and the bottom line of it is get to know someone or imagine someone that you're making stuff for and you've got an interesting approach that I just wanted to say that. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, you nailed it. That's hundred um, percent. All right, keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you. Oh. Oh, no, no worries. No, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, find something you love about marketing. Mm-hmm. 
This is, um, I think, a, a hard leap for people because I think as artists, a, a lot of people that, most people that are designers, I think that uh, Charles Anderson from CSA Images had said this. He said, no one, no one when they're a kid says, I, someday I want to grow up in current letters. There's my timer. Um, he had said, no kids grows up saying, I, uh, someday I want to like track in current letters, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, they, they draw and then eventually that transfers into um, creating art. Um, and then eventually that transfers into being a graphic designer. So find something you love about marketing. I guess the point is, is that most of us as artists feel like, well, we, my work should speak for itself. And that's fine if you want to do that. But if you're, if you're interested in making money and not everyone is, but if you're interested in, in making more money, you really have to find something to love about marketing and become a marketer. Uh, it just, people, it's very rare that people will just randomly find things and start buying them. Um, so marketing stuff that I love, I love copywriting. Um, for people that aren't familiar, copywriting is essentially the right, the, the art of writing persuasive text um, that helps to sell a product. I love email. I, some people hate email. I love email. I subscribe to tons of email lists. I read all the emails. I click through on the emails. I unsubscribe from them to see what happens when I unsubscribe from them. Um, I see what happens when I respond to the person that wrote it to me. I take screenshots of emails. I make swipe files. In other words, I <laughs> copy parts of emails that I love, and find yeah. ways to readapt it to what I'm doing. Um, you're a student of the game is what you're doing. You take this yeah, up seriously, yeah, just, right? Yeah, I, I just I love this stuff. I'm I'm a geek for this stuff, mm -hmm. and there's so much more. Marketing, as you know, is a huge, vast world. You, you might hate email. That might not be the thing for 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 you out there listening. Maybe it's something else. But I guarantee, you, if you start digging into marketing, you'll find some things that speak to you. And in just a minute, I'm going to show you a book that has so many ideas of different things you might love um, that I encourage you to buy or check out from the library or do whatever. Um, niching down. That was another thing that was big for me. I creative market at one point got acquired by Autodesk and I knew they were going to get a lot bigger. And I started to notice there was a lot of um, like brush script fonts and a lot of watercolor illustrations. Those were becoming big and like all this retro supply stuff I was doing was becoming not as big. And so I had to make a decision. Am I going to become a different business and start selling brush scripts? Or am I going to double down on making this retro stuff? And I decided, no, like I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to compromise what I'm interested in. There's a history behind the reason I do what I do. And I decided I'm going to double down on this and either I'm going to go bankrupt and have to figure out something else, or I'm going to be really successful because I'm going to be the one that doubled down when everyone else kind of did this mass migration to um, watercolors and brush scripts. Um, and then customer research. I love customer research. I know something people always ask is what should I make? The first couple of products you make, you might need to like take some guesses and just randomly try stuff. But once you have a few customers, you can just ask them. Our, our best selling products have happened because I've just sent out emails and I've said, what do you want me to make? Tell me what the, what the if, if I could make anything for you, what would it be? And people tell you what they want. And then you look at what the most people are telling you and you make that. It's, it's a super simple um, recipe for making something successful is to stop guessing and start just listening to what people ask you to make. Mm -hmm. It sounds totally um, obvious, but it's not obvious. It's not as intuitive as you think. You're saying to people, ask a good question and then just listen and then follow up on that. It's a very simple recipe for building rapport with anybody. Exactly. There's a um, there's an author and a marketer named uh, Jeff Walker, I believe his name is, and he has a, a one question survey he'll send out, and he'll mm -hmm. say, if there was one thing that had to be inside of a product for you to buy it, what would it be? Mm. And I've done and I've asked that question so many times, and people will tell you very specific things, and you put that in, and then you can literally copy and paste their responses into your email or into however you're selling and send it back to them once you've created the product and say, I made, insert whatever all these people described. How do you not buy that when it describes exactly, when you reflect back to them exactly what they asked for? Uh, and of course, the, the really key component of this is that we work our butts off to make really, really great products 
we invest huge amounts of time in it. It's not just me. So like when you were showing the different stuff we've made, that's not just me by myself doing that stuff. That's me recruiting people like uh, my heroes. Like we made a font with uh, Hoods Put Design Co. If you're oh yeah, them. sure. Yeah. So we made a font called Palm Canyon Drive. We made that with them because I can't do her style. She's amazing. Mm-hmm. I said, would you make, would you make this with us? It would be so amazing to have you do it. And she made that because I thought she might never make something like this on her own, but it's so killer. I can't do it. Designers would love it. And so we came to an agreement and we made a product together. Um, Brad Woodard, again, with the brushes. I said, Brad, you make such amazing illustrations. Can, can I partner with you in some way where we can work together to make a brush set that's just amazing for the people buying it? Um, mm-hmm. Some of the other stuff you showed was a guy named Lenny Terenzi from North Carolina. He's a friend that I know that has a screen printing shop called Hey Monkey Design. He, he, he makes all of our shirts for us. Our shirts are um, something that people love. They're just like these, they feel like a hug on you. They're so soft and like just feel good, right? They just fit perfect. Um, so I said, why don't we make a product where you're a screen printer? Why don't you make the textures? And that way we know these textures are perfect if you want to screen print or if you want to do flat stock printing. Mm. Um, and so he made this pack. And I, I don't own a screen shop screen printing studio, but I know how to market it. I know how to figure out exactly what people want. And then he knows how to translate into that, that into the very best version of itself that it can be. Um, so, so yeah. I got like a quick a question of, for you. When you say you collaborate yeah. with other designers and artists, is there a revenue share model that you do with them? How does that work? Yeah. What are the terms? Yeah, it depends. Mm-hmm. So if someone's a, well, first of all, I give people an option. So a lot of times what I'll say is I'll, I'll pay you a flat rate to do this. I see. Or, or I'll give you a profit share and I'll say, I'll, I'll explain the risks and rewards. You might release this and you might make nothing. Right. <laughs> you know, it, maybe no one buys it or you might make a ton or I can pay you a flat rate mm. and you're guaranteed the money. It's really your choice. Mm-hmm. Um, in some cases, someone just has a really big following and I say, hey, let's partner up. Mm-hmm. You have a huge following um, and I think we can make a like very, very great product if we partner up. So it, it depends on the situation. Um, mm-hmm. If someone doesn't have a big following, um, oftentimes they'll be contracted out. Right. Um, you just pay them whatever they think is fair for the, for what they make. Right. And yeah. can you give us some guidelines? If, if I have, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm watching this right now. Okay. I'm a, I'm in love with retro supply company. I'm in love with Dustin Lee. And I'm like, you know, I don't have a big following, but I'm a really good artist. I do this thing. How much can I expect to, to make? And, and if you were to pay me a flat rate, give me some ranges so I can think about this, Dustin. Um, Gosh, you know, it, it varies so much. I guess it's gone anywhere from. Sorry to put you on the spot, dude. No, no, I'm just thinking about it. I mean, there's been situations where we've done long-term partnerships where it was just next to nothing, where it was $500, but mm-hmm. we were, this is for a very minor product or maybe right. just doing the illustrations for a product. Um, just showing what it can do up to um, there's been people I've worked with where I've paid them $20,000. Wow. Damn. So it's so a big range. So there. it depends. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it depends. And, and you know, some, some people, everyone's in a different position. Some people are in a position where um, they have a big following and I'm saying, Hey, let's make something together. I think together we can make something really successful because I know like your thing is creating, creating art, creating design. Mm-hmm. Mine is, running the shop, I'll do the running the shop, I'll do the promoting of this, and I'll make sure that this product is packaged and presented in a way that is exciting to customers and that guarantees we're gonna get good reviews and people are gonna be happy with it. Um, and then in other cases, you have people that are starting out that say, I really wanna do something like this. I wanna create my own passive income. And I'll say, okay, well, um, why don't you make a product for less, but I'm gonna show you how to do this. I'm gonna put links to your site and I'm going to show you how to leverage the, um, the access to the audience that I'm giving you. Yeah. And you that, know, and it, in many ways, you know, money doesn't just come in, in cash transferred into your account. It comes in, in um, finding the right customers. Right. Well, I just want to say uh, something here <clears throat> because we have a global audience and there's people in developing countries. So even as you're listening to this, there's some of you that might think, well, $500 is not a lot and $20,000 seems like a lot. But there are some people who live in developing countries where making $4,000 a year, that's like a good living. So just think about that as you guys are trying to sling it. And because we get this question asked of us all the time, Chris, clients here don't value design. I get paid $50 for a logo. And the, the, the automatic response I give to them 
almost always is this, is why do you feel compelled only to work in the market that you're in? You're allowed mm. to work anywhere in the world. So when you're selling a product on creative market, either through the retro supply company or on your own, you're working at the international standard now. So if you can bring in four or five thousand dollars of passive income and you had all year to make one or two products or a bundle, or whatever is one of your secret strategies. If you did that, you would make more than most people in a year and you would be your own boss and you would kind of have a lot of free time. So if you're in the Philippines, if you're in Cairo, if you're in one of these other countries where just there's not a lot of money or opportunity, I hear you, but don't be a victim to your circumstance. Go ahead and get into the market. That's why I'm so excited to talk to people like you, Dustin, because everything that you do, is it's wide open for everybody. It doesn't matter it where you are. As long as you have an internet connection and you have some tools to make stuff and you get smart about the marketing and listening to your customers, you're gonna do pretty good. Oh, absolutely. I mean. There's, uh, for instance, there's, I can't remember the name of the studio, but there's like a, a type foundry. I think it's in, I think it's in Thailand or maybe, mm -hmm. I think it's Thailand. Anyways, you, you see these guys, they love what they're doing. They're, they've, they, they've rented out their own little office and, and they're making a killing. I mean, I'm like, wow, these, these guys are making the, the, the same amount on this kind of product as I am. And I know that the, um, the exchange rate is crazy. Right. Because it's pretty so, inexpensive to live in Thailand. Yeah, from yeah. what I understand, I don't know mm -hmm. a ton about it, but yeah, I think that it's a, they're making a really great living doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll wrap up this because this is just about the end of the presentation. Okay. I just want to share this book here. Cool. So um, I found out about this book. It's a it's a it's a hidden gem at the back of a um, four hour work week. He mentions different books you should read, and it's at the very back, and it's kind of just briefly mentioned. And I bought it, and it's called How to Make Millions with Your Ideas, um, and it's by Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy is like this old school direct mail marketer. Big mustache, looks like a, I don't know, like a cowboy or something like that from Buster Scruggs or something like that. And he just, the book is just page after page after page of unconventional ways of making money. And the cool thing is, is you can read it, you can open it to any page and say, oh, I could see how I could apply that idea to what I do. So for instance, like a big part of what's helped us grow is that we've done a lot of unconventional things. So I'll, I'll name a couple for you. We tried doing a product where buy it today and then every week for the next four weeks, we're going to send you like another episode essentially of the product, mm -hmm. right? Like, and each one had a different theme. Um, we did webinars where they were free. We did webinars where we charged a hundred dollars. We did a webinar that went so horrible that I got kicked off the call and I was gone for 30 minutes, which were the most longest 30 minutes of my life that people had paid for. Um, and a lot of people wanted returns and a lot of people were angry, <laughs> but we tried different stuff. Um, we tried selling shirts. We looked into making action figures of our mascot. Hmm. Uh, we made something called the I want it all box, which is essentially we said, what if we got all of our products that are digital and made them into a physical object made a box out of them and sold the box for $600. That was, that ended up being one of like the smartest things we ever did. It's wow. like a really neat thing to do. Very few people like, uh, like I don't know anyone actually that's done that. But I guess the point is, is that like by reading books like this, you come up with all sorts of in interesting ways to do things. And when you do that, that's how you stand out. That's how people remember you. They say this crazy person like made a box of this stuff. It's so ridiculous. In fact, every time I put it up for sale, Someone says, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Why do you keep sending me emails about this stupid box? But other people tell me, this is so amazing. And they'll send you, you know, Instagram shots of it and tell you how much they love it. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I highly recommend this book. I think it's like 12 bucks or something like that on Amazon. I'm not, I'm not getting any affiliate thing or something for it. It's just I am. Book. So hold on, guys. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you a link. The link in the description. Yeah, we'll do that in a second. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, we are business be, people after all. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's be honest. Keep going. Uh, and then finally, just like start now and be prepared to fail. Um, something I heard the other day, and I, I feel like it's a very common theme as well. I did this and then it didn't work. So I guess that doesn't work. And the reality is, is I remember hearing, uh, gosh, I don't know who it was. It was some famous songwriter. He said, it takes around 100 songs to write a good song. So just remember, if something doesn't work the first time, it might take a lot of times before it works. 
and you can tell the people that are going to succeed not by their not by their talent or 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 something like that you can tell they can they're going to succeed because they're consistent they release things they try different things they become predictable in fact i remember when i first started my only goal was to release something every week and i had people write me and say i know every tuesday at three o'clock something comes out from you so i look forward to it nice um so just be prepared to fail a lot and put stuff out there and be embarrassed and make mistakes that is the price of entrance um into most th- into most things mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Um, that's it. Okay, cool. I'm going to show you guys the I want it all in a box image in a little bit. But before I do that, uh, I just want to make sure that you guys got our Amazon link. And there was a question that was asked uh, on a super chat. Do we make money off Amazon affiliates? Yes, we do. It's not a lot of money. I think it's only three or four percent because not enough people are buying things on Amazon for it to make a difference, but we do. It's like putting out a lot of little buckets to collect the rain that's coming down. I also want to say thank you to Let's Talk Branding uh, for their super chat, uh, which is uh, the, the comment was, great collab. Thanks for all the amazing content in 2018, guys. Looking forward to 2019. Well, we appreciate you for doing the super chat with us. Now, I'm going to switch over my screen here. So you guys start formulating your well thought out and intentional questions while I share my screen. Come on, baby. You could do this. I spent a lot of money on this laptop. Come on. There we go. And then here it is. The I want it all in a box. So can Donna, I stop sharing my screen? Is that okay? Yeah, you can no? stop sharing. Yeah. So here it is. You guys can see it. It literally is a box with tons of stuff in it. It's called the I want it all. I'm making zero affiliate deals on this. Maybe later. So some stickers, pins, there's a USB. I assume the USB jump drive has all the digital assets in it. Yeah. So, okay. So this is a $600 box. It yeah. would be completely insane if it was $600 for a t-shirt and some stickers. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that makes it worth $600 is that it has a hand, like a hand sanded stained wooden USB inside of it. Um, that has every product we've ever made on it. Um, so essentially you're just getting a physical version of everything we've ever made. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people like that. I talked to a guy that was a, um, funnily enough, he was a, I think he was a, he had a master's degree in poetry and he had all these letter presses because he loved to print poetry on his letter press. Wow. And, and he kept it, he kept it right in front of his computer, the, the little US, the wooden USB drive. And he was like, I, I just, I just love this. It's just like a little experimentation box for me. You know, like when I'm trying to come up with a fresh idea, I. I load it up and I and it doesn't take up a lot of the space on my computer because it's on a USB, and um, it's for him. Very cool. You know, I'm I'm glad you kind of explained that you actually work with other people because first, when you were saying we we do this, I was like, oh, he's going Kanye on me right now, just talking about himself in <laughs> in the plural here. We we do. It's like I, I think it's just you, doesn't? But you're saying that you collaborate with other artists. So, cut to my screen shot or my screen for a second. You see this illustration here, the Atomic Age one. Can you see that, Dustin? I did see it. Mm-hmm. Can you see it right there? So, yeah. did, yes. did, was that somebody else or is that you illustrating this kid with a wink? That is neither. That's a, um, okay, so this is a whole different It's a tangent. secret. Here it comes. Um, so, I had collected a bunch of old 1940s. Back in the 1940s, they used to sell catalogs of um, retro clip art. Mm-hmm. Well, back then it wasn't retro. It was just clip art. It was clip art that they would use in advertisements. Um, I had bought a bunch of it. I didn't know if it was legit to use. So I ended up sending this musty box to these intellectual property attorneys that funnily enough turned into marijuana attorneys now. Um, <laughs> but I sent it to them in California mm-hmm. and they went through everything and told me what was okay to use. They grade it. They don't say it's 100% okay, but they grade it essentially on risk. And they said, this is very, very likely okay to use. This is not. Um, and then I digitized all that. And so I have this huge library stuff that I had bought and had attorneys look at. Mm. That's one of your seven tips, which is to resell stuff in the public domain, right? Is that one of your tips uh, or no? Gosh, I don't know. I've made well, a lot of content. <laughs> I mean, that definitely could, that definitely could be a tip. Um, I mean, we have some clip art that we sell. We don't make a ton of money off of it. Yeah. But one thing that we do do, here's a perfect example of stuff in the public domain. So my friend Jason Karn, um, he's an amazing lettering artist. He spent over, I think now, he spent now over $12,000 buying rare vintage lettering books like from like 
I don't know, like 100, 120 years ago. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. And he meticulously photographed every one. And then one day it occurred to him, well, why don't I just like sell these to other people? I spent $12,000 buying all these. Um, and so you can check it out, by the way. It's called like, I think it's just called Lettering Library. Um, and um, so we started selling a bundle of these together. That was public domain. But the thing is, it would cost, you know, like literally it cost him $12,000. It would cost $12,000 to acquire these. So to be able to buy this bundle for, um, like right now, for a very brief time, it's on sale for just 50, but regularly he sells it for around 200, um, is a great deal. Yeah, it's public domain, but you can't just find it anywhere. Um, not to mention you have a guy who's a true connoisseur of this kind of lettering who has collected these books out of love long before he ever thought about trying to make money from them. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys know this and I'm not, I don't pretend to be a, an attorney on TV or anything, but when the copyright expires on, on things, you can, anybody can use it. Anybody can reproduce it. And certain things can't be copyrighted like functional objects, as we found out when we had an attorney on the show. But just to refresh your memory, you guys, if you guys want to know more about what's going on and what we're talking about with Dustin, go to PassiveIncomeForDesigners.com. I know it's a mouthful, lots of letters in there. PassiveIncomeForDesigners with an S.com. And he wrote this article dated May, May 27, 2017, Seven Ways to Make a Passive Income Product Fast. And all the way at the bottom, because I did do a little research, it says here, number six, sell public domain work. This is the low-hanging fruit. So you can take things that are out of... A copyright protection that are in the public domain and you can do something to it you can literally just scan it in and auto trace vectorize it or you can do what charles anderson does which he hires illustrators to redraw it and clean everything up and make it super nice then exactly. that becomes the only, you know the funny thing is that there's always objections to this type of thing so what's the um, objection we did a web well well for instance we did a webinar and we mm-hmm. posted it on youtube and someone um had said um WTF seriously or oh, no. making money off other people's work. I mean, you know, you know, YouTube comments, um, yes, this community yes. sounds amazing, but they can be the worst. Yes, they can um, be. Yeah. But, but the thing is, is, is that think about it. I mean, so 2019 was a big year. Um, copywriting legislation that had been going on for 50 years opened up all sorts of things. Um, like the really noted example being that the woods by um, Robert Frost became public domain. It can now be on, um, I don't know, oven mitts. Right. And people do, and people do that. Um, when you go to the, when you go to Barnes and Nobles or Amazon and you buy, uh, I don't know, the works of Montaigne or something like that, those are public domain. No one owns those anymore. So this person is saying, well, I can't believe you're doing that, but these, these books we were selling were over a hundred years old, way past the public domain date. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, if you're not going to do that, then you really shouldn't be watching Disney movies. They're made off of public domain, you know, folk tales. Um, you shouldn't be buying any books, any of the great literature. You shouldn't be buying Shakespeare. Um, you shouldn't be. You, you get what I'm saying with this? I 100 um, percent get what you're saying with this. Let me just say this uh, so that we're very clear and on the record uh, for all 773 people that are watching this right now. OK. The future and what we're saying is not for everybody. We're kind of like a dog whistle. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a creative person, you think, you know what? We're here to live a creative life and profit from our ideas. And in the rules, it says you can do this. And if you choose not to do it, that's your right to do that. And it's also your right to go ahead and do it like what we're talking about and to ignore those people. And that's okay, too. So if it doesn't work for you, don't worry about it. More for us. And you're right, (laughs) Dustin. Because you're already buying all these things all the time and you're just not aware of it. So the idea of it kind of sounds grating to you. It feels like it's wrong. It's unethical. But you, you can either get over it or not. Don't worry about it. The, the rest of us who want to do it will make money and you, you, you can go and be miserable. That's fine. That's your choice. <laughs> well, and I think I should be clear here, too. Um, the retro supply was not built. In fact, the revenue that comes from public domain things is... Um, is uh negligible Mm -hmm. i mean talking let five percent or less Mm -hmm. um we're we're making stuff off of you know i buy a lot of stuff from say mid-century american artwork we'll we'll make brush packs where we'll refer to those brushes to come up with ideas and to see what they look like but then we're working with new artists who are being paid very good amounts of money or they're getting partnerships i mean i have partners who have made probably over a hundred thousand dollars partnered with me over the years from doing this. So most of the stuff we create is original stuff based on historical artwork. We are not just digging through 
the public domain and taking everything out of the public domain and making money. That is 5% of the business, if that. Yeah. Um, and I just want to make that clear. Well, I want to make one other point here before we beat a dead horse here. I know a lot of people love and respect and cherish Aaron Draplin as we do. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but it, correct me if I'm wrong, people that are watching here. He made a font, and you know what his font was based on? He photographed a bunch of letters on a building, and he converted that into his a vector font that you can use as uh, you can load on your computer. And his philosophy is he's rescued that from the dustbin, from history. He's rescued that so that you guys can use that. It didn't take a ton of effort to make that, but he did that. Oh, if you have a problem yeah. with that, then you have a problem with all of this and don't support anybody. Don't worry about it. But you guys just well, got to get over it. Get over it. That reminds I can't see the comments, so I can't, I can't yeah, see I can. what people <laughs> So who knows what's going to happen? A lot of people don't like that, but I'll, I'll give you another very similar example. So mm -hmm. um, there's um, someone else that we've done a pack with called, um, and it's called Wood Type Revival. This is um, a, a talented designer, and he had went to a um, type foundry like an, that did wood type yep. and there was just piles of wood type in this garage area. And he's like, what happens to this? And he's like, and they're like, well, we throw it away. He's like, sometimes like the guys just like put it in the back of their truck and they bring it and they just um, like literally go camping and light it on fire as firewood. Like no joke. So this guy said, well, can I just take it or can I pay you and take it with me? And he took it and he converted it into fonts um, that he sold. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he literally saved it from from the fire in some cases. Right. I don't. I, I don't know. Like, the, does he deserve to be Condemned. rewarded? I don't know <laughs> if he does. But I, I think that's not him money for yeah. it. Have to make money than have that stuff all dumped into a fire. That's right. So here's how you guys can do this. You can vote with your your pocketbook. You can say, "I don't like that idea. Don't buy it." And you're like, this is cool. Thank you for saving that. I had no other access to it. Then you could buy it. But you're right. There's a ton of books out there which you guys buy and are happy to buy. Clip art books, um, books that document different artifacts like monograms and symbols, things that have been lost to history. They've gone through and painstakingly photographed them, reassembled them in a book, got it all cleared so that you can buy it. You don't have an issue with that. So it's just make sure that there's symmetry of logic here. Okay, I want to ask this question on behalf of Jermaine Chase, who, who super chatted us. He said, what are your best marketing tactics that you use? Um, well, by far, my best marketing tactic, tactic is um, email. So something I learned when I worked for uh, Paid to Exist before I started Retro Supply was the importance of an email list. Um, email lists are just highly responsive. Uh, you're not competing against a bunch of other messages on Instagram or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for instance, as soon as my creative market stop, shop started to do well, I immediately um, in the bio put a link to my own site and said, hey, come to my site and um, I'll, give you some, I'll give you some free products if you'll give me your email address, which um, turned out to be a very good move because creative market got a lot more saturated. Um, I don't know if I'd be in business if I hadn't built my own site. So I use that email list now. And it, originally, you know, 100% of the money I made was coming from Creative Market. Today, um, uh, gosh, 15% maybe comes from Creative Market. The rest comes from my own site. Mm -hmm. So um, the biggest thing I would say is build an email list. Um, don't wait until everything's perfect to build it. Start building it. Um, and send content to it on a regular basis. Um, it's not, a lot of people are intimidated by that, but it's the best thing you can do by far. Mm -hmm. um, another, another great thing to do is to leverage other people's audiences. Um, so if you don't have traffic, um, which none of us do when we start, you need to find people that do have traffic. You need to find some sort of value you can give to them. And in that sense, get traffic from them. So I'll give you an example. You might be familiar with uh, Spoon Graphics. No, but sounds interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. No. Okay. Yes. So Spoon Graphics, it's, it's a really, really great guy named Chris Spooner. He lives in uh, the UK uh, and he kind of has a retro aesthetic to the stuff that he does. And when I made my first product or one of my first products, I sent it to him and I just said, here, I want to give this to you as a gift because I just appreciate all the stuff, all the tutorials and all the stuff you made. And he wrote me back and he said, man, this is great. Like, would you mind if like we, you know, gave this away to people like that are in this group that I have? And I said, sure. And Chris Spooner has a 
big email list. I mean, I think he has, he probably gets over a million views a month. I don't know. He gets a ton. Um, and has an email list of at least a hundred thousand. These are, these are guesses, but I can kind of get a decent sense from doing this for a while. Um, and by doing that, I got tons of traffic. I mean, it, that is another huge thing you can do. Don't just rely on yourself to get traffic. You need partners and other people to share your work. And that means typically catering to what they want, what will help them um, mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. do that. Okay, you know what? Because at the top of the show, I promised some hot tips and secrets, and I want to give this a little structure. And I also want to be able to hit. There's so many questions that I'm looking on YouTube, the chat, mm -hmm. that are really good. I want to be able to ask you. So, Greg, I'm going to prime you right now to get those questions ready for us. Oh, yeah. We want to get into lightning round when we're ready. Okay, so get those ready, Greg. So I, I think you can see my screen now, right? Passive yeah. income product. Yeah, you can see that, Dustin. Mm -hmm. Yes. So seven yes. ways to. Oh, to to massive income product fast. Okay, so I, I would just like for you to speak about these talking points here. So when you say package rejected work, what does that mean? Oh right, okay. So um, a lot of people have hard drives that are just graveyards full of stuff that got rejected mm -hmm. or not used um, by clients. Um, in other other cases, for example, my friend Rocky Rourke, he has all these color palettes in Illustrator. Um, people are constantly in his Instagram being like, where, where can I get your color palettes? These, these are all things that are just things sitting on your hard drive that aren't doing anything for you. So why not look at those rejected or byproducts of your work and think about selling them? If, you, if you're creating an illustration, why not record your screen while you're doing it and then notate it later right. and, and sell that? These are all things you're doing anyways, or that you've made in that have been rejected. So in what ways can you get those things and and repackage and repurpose them Perfect. to be useful to other people. In the book Rework, I think they talk about having a garage sale of your digital assets, go through and clean out whatever it is that you're not using and package it up and sell it. It doesn't have to be sold for a lot, but when when people buy this in volume, it can add up to be quite a bit. Because we have so many points to go through, Dustin, I just want you to just give us the goods. Scan textures, what do you mean? That seems pretty obvious. Yeah, this is this is super ob obvious. So. Um, scan texture so i for instance was in alabama i went to a gigantic flea market they had so many old books and different old paper textures i bought i don't know maybe 50 dollars worth of them brought them home with me i uh, have a really high resolution scanner and mm -hmm. i just scan them package them really nicely showed examples of how they could be used with tutorial videos and sold them it doesn't sell it doesn't sell a ton you know because it's low-hanging fruit a lot right. of people can make textures like that pretty quickly but um but you that, know that's when you're in a pinch, it's a midnight, and you don't have that texture, and you need it for a project you're working on, four bucks, I'm buying that texture. It's done. Okay. Yeah. Heck yeah. Next one. You want to say something, Greg? Just agree. Oh, that's like that's me. <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go back to my slide here. So here's the third one. You say make your own resource for a client project. What does that mean? Make your own resources for a client. It's almost project. like you didn't write this blog or something. <laughs> <laughs> I did, but I, I, I wrote this 2017. About a year ago. Yeah. Um. You want me to read it for you? Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Jog my memory on this one. Yeah, no, I'll, let me uh, refresh your memory here. Okay. What you're saying is when you make your own resources for a client project, do you have something that you always have to do when you're setting up a client project? Instead of redoing it every single time, create an action template or checklist. Chances are somebody else is going to do the same thing and they're going to save time with your product as well. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't need to repeat that. that yeah, that's yes. the, okay. I, there we go. People do that. It's, it's effective. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. We're going to get to point number four. Here we go. Point number four. Try Font Self Maker. I've never even heard of that. Font Self Maker. Yeah. yeah so well, it's called Font Self. Um, and uh, it might, it might, maybe it's called Font Self Maker still. Um, it, it was originally a Kickstarter project. Essentially, mm -hmm. what they did is they made it so you can make fonts in Photoshop or Illustrator. You don't have to go into um say glyphs yes to do it it's very very easy to use most people even when they start with glyphs build fonts out in illustrator then move them to right. glyphs and then they eventually graduate to just building things in glyphs font self maker is i don't think the best way to make fonts i don't think anyone would agree that it's the most professional way to make fonts but we're talking about the hardest part um of getting anything going and i know this from seeing this hundreds and hundreds of times is getting something out the door so right. Font Self Maker makes the process of creating a font smooth. So at least you can get that font out the door and say, I made a font. So 
So make one, you can do it in an evening. You could do it in a couple evenings in a week and have your first font out and you've just shifted your mindset. Now you're someone that makes fonts. Yeah. And I've seen people like, I think uh, Maddox Scholler, he's a fantastic font maker. He started by making a, um, a very simple font and now he's, I mean, a profound font maker. You know, you gotta start somewhere and that's a very easy way to start. Mm -hmm. You can buy an old book of type specimens that there's a typeface that was drawn the old way. You can scan that in, you can redraw it and you can get on Font Self Maker and make something. Just the, the whole point of it is, is don't let the tools, the technology or all the, the, the hurdles that you gotta jump through to be the thing that holds you back from making something, right? Here we go, number five, cause you have nine, even though it's at seven, you're an overachiever. Create a product machine. What does that mean? Yeah, so, okay, so when you make, when you, when you start making products, you'll start to notice that the same things happen over and over again. Um, so for instance, in my business, um, we, a lot of people are grateful that we have really, really good instructions. We've invested a lot of time in making instructions with clear images and step-by-step um, -step instructions. So, but we keep doing that. And eventually we realized, why don't we have a template for this? If we're, if we're giving, selling people Procreate brushes, why would we make the instructions 10 times? Just use the same instructions. Or if we're making um, instructions for Illustrator brushes, why change the way you do it? So in other, in other words, think of it like an assembly line. There's a lot of things that can be repurposed. Another example is, uh, let's say you're making Procreate brush packs. If, if you have a certain shape, for instance, there's shape sources and grain sources when you're making Procreate packs. If you're making a variety of different brushes, save the shape sources and the grain sources. There's nothing wrong with the same one being used again if that's the one that makes sense. Perfect. We've already talked about number six. Uh, number six here. Can I go backwards? No, I can't. Is to sell public domain work. We're not going to go over that. See that. We'll timestamp it for you guys. Number seven. Here we go. Record, transcribe, edit. What does that mean? Yeah. So, um, okay. So, great example of this. We have a pack called the Woodland Wonderland Brush Pack. Um, mm -hmm. This is a collaboration again with my friend Brad Woodard. If you haven't checked out his stuff, you can check out Brave the Woods. Um, just amazing illustrations. Uh, he's also. Um, one of the top uh, teachers on Skillshare. So he, when we were making a pack, I said, you know, you're making the illustrations for the pack anyways. This kind of goes back to repurposing work as well. So he said, why don't you, we bought some software, which is called Camtasia. Mm -hmm. We bought the software. I said, why don't you record yourself making, making this um, illustration? And then we can go back, we can edit out the chunks where you're stopping and you're looking at references or you're going and getting coffee or eating cereal. And we can edit all those pieces out. We can put text that explains what's happening. We can do overdubs on what you're saying. And we can turn this from a time lapse of, of you working into a very succinct video of how to achieve a result that a lot of people are wondering, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. So if you're about to start an illustration, whether it be in Photoshop, Illustrator, Procreate, whatever, think about recording that um, and having it available to edit for the future. There's a lot of people that would pay good money to see how you make something because it saves them hours and hours, weeks of trying to figure it out themselves. Right. That's a super hot tip. It's something that I believe in as well. Because to buy a drive from Western Digital or one of those companies, a four terabyte drive, it's like a hundred bucks. It's nothing. You can just buy the software, which I believe is also like inexpensive. Is it like a hundred bucks, Camtasia? It's a, it's a hundred bucks and you get like a 14 day free trial. So Okay, there you go. So for an investment yeah. of $200, $200 right now, which almost everybody that's watching this can afford, you can just start screen recording your work. You don't have to do anything with it until later. Just start screen recording while you work. If you're a graphic designer, illustrator, if you're a retoucher, whatever it is you're doing, or a 3D modeler, just record right now because it's just money in the bank and you can cash that in later. Just out of curiosity, how much did you wind up selling that course for? In that case, mm -hmm. um, we did, we, we, this was another thing where we experimented. We made one where we just sold the brushes. That was $19. We made one where, um, we gave like a core video on how to do an illustration. That was 29. And then we did another one with multiple videos and I believe that was 39. Mm -hmm. And did it and, sell uh, well? Yeah. I mean, it sells to this day. I mean, I'm sending him checks every month to this day. So yeah, it sold. It sold pretty good. What would you have? Um, can you guesstimate how much revenue that that has earned uh, from 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 its lifetime thus far? 
ballpark? Oh gosh, it would be really hard to guess. It's definitely tens of thousands of dollars. Okay, so sure. you guys can see that. So even something that starts as little as nineteen dollars and on up to thirty nine dollars can earn you ten tens of thousands of dollars. It adds up. It does add up. It adds up. Okay, so the next one, eight and nine. Eight is something we've already talked about. Thank you, Joan, for missing my slide there. Uh, find the partnerships, one, which we've already talked about. You've talked about that pretty extensively, so we won't go into that. And lastly is make something that you need. And you've also talked about that, right? Make yep. something you need. So why don't we do this? Let's get into the lightning round and let's get as many questions as we can. So I'm going to ask you to keep your answers under 15 seconds. Okay, because there's so many good questions I'm seeing in the chat window and we want to get to them for everybody's tuning in live. And our audience has grown a little bit, I think. Right, Greg? Yeah, there are over 800 people watching right now. 812. Let's do it. Let's do it, Greg. Okay. All right. Dustin, you ready? Greg, you look good yes. today, man. I just want to say, well, you know, clean shaven, just the hair's right and everything's good. <laughs> oh, hey, thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, okay, so Lisa asks, how do you market your products? Do you use social or is it purely email? So I think like... Do you take out ads on social media like Facebook and Instagram? Uh, I'm dabbling in ads in social media, but it's primarily email, Instagram, and that's it. Okay. Andrada has asked, what inspires you to create these things? I think I know, but I'm just curious. I was uh, raised a lot when I was really young by my grandmother, and they lived in a house that they inherited that the only rule of them having it was that they could not change it. So it looked like it was from the 19, right out of the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, so I grew up around all this mid-century oh, wow. modern type stuff. And that stuff is just very nostalgic to me. So this business is an extension of that. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. Dang. Next question, Greg. Good. We're doing well now, you guys. All right. We're going to burn through these. Let's go. So this was a burning question from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the best way to find public domain art? Oh, gosh. Um, Go junk it, man. No? Uh, well, one, one place to start is to look at, at, at Do I, I don't know, even know if I should say this. One place to, to start is to look at Dover. Dover has made mm -hmm. an entire business out of public domain artwork. They try to put all these threats in the beginning that you can't use their stuff. And you can't take stuff from a Dover art book. But if Dover is making it, there, there's a good chance that it's public domain. They are typically mm -hmm. talking about having a copyright to the order or the way they've organized the work. But if Dover has it, and you can find the original source material, that's a good starting point to bring that to an IP attorney and see if it's legit to use. But I highly recommend using an attorney. Okay, uh, Chung Yi is asking, is it dangerous to market your side gig when working full-time as a designer? I worry my boss thinks I'm not invested in my day job. Um. I can't really answer that. Well, I was working in an online marketing business related to doing work you love. So I, there was no competition. And when I had a child and was going through this, yeah. my boss was super cool. And he said, I just want you to be happy and do what's you know, best for your family. So okay. I can't answer that. Well, you know what? So here's the thing. I say this to everybody that works for me. I want you to show up and give me an honest eight hours of worth of work every day. What you do on your own time, if you want to, I don't know, finger knit or juggle or work on your side hustle. I actually encourage you. I'm motivated and inspired by people who are ambitious and are driven. And I like that. One of our core values is to have this uh, never ending curiosity. And I can't expect that only to be turned on from 10 to seven. I just can't expect that. It's not realistic. If somebody has a problem with that and your work is not compromised at work, it's time to move on. Next question, Greg. Okay. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to butcher this, but I see on industries asks, what are the pros and cons of selling content uh, via online markets like uh, Video Hive and Creative Market? Good question. Yeah, so the, the pros of selling on places like Creative Market or other places like that is that they are driving all the traffic for you. So they're doing ads through Google in different places. You're getting access to a market that's interested in buying. Um, the downside of it is that the barrier to entry to making a lot of this stuff is very low and very quickly someone can replicate and compete against you and destroy your sales and your efforts. So uh, as a follow-up question to that, how have you managed to kind of stay on top or, or stay a, a ahead of that curve of people uh, ripping you off basically? Good follow-up. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, by moving as many people as possible to my own site, 
I'm happy to sell their creative market. I'm happy to give them a percentage of the sales. They're amazing. I've met the whole team and went down and visited them numerous times over the years. Um, but really the only defense you have is you need to get people onto your own site where you control the conversation, where there's not suggested products all around you, where there's not people driving the price down. Excellent. Makes sense. All yeah. right. I got a, I got a question to comment here. An internal dialogue happening on the chat here. Tasha is saying back to Chung Yi, he's like, I'm currently working my full-time designer job while watching this video and taking notes on my own design <laughs> business. So that may be crossing the line a little bit. That's Greg, what do you think? Is that crossing the line? That's a very gray area right there to be That's in. not even gray, yeah. dude. That's black. You've already moved into the black area because they're paying you to do a job. And you're like, oh, excuse me while yeah. I work on my side hustle and watch this video. Yeah. Unless unless your job is investigate what YouTube creators are telling you on how right. to create a passive income <laughs> so you can quit. Unless that's your job title, there may be some issues there. But I thought it was pretty funny. Greg, what else you got? Um, let's see. We, I think we've answered most, most of these already. Um, bu, bu, bu. oh, okay. Uh, this is a great question. How do you tackle piracy? <laughs> you can't <laughs> How do you defeat piracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah. mean like, or d is there anything you do to try to make it more difficult for, for people to, to steal? So yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. So, uh, Companies like Creative Market have entire departments devoted to piracy and they can't even, I mean, it's like whack-a-mole. They can't even it's fight impossible. piracy. Right. Piracy is going to happen. So the way I, the way I personally look at it is um, sometimes we send cease and desist letters, but for the most part, we try to do piracy jujitsu. So if they're going to give it away for free, we've experimented with ideas of, well, let's put links in the PDFs. Let's offer free things in the PDFs. These guys are doing free advertising for us. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we've tried is we've tried putting notes into the PDF instructions that say, hey, you know what? You don't have to go to them. If you really want this product and you can't afford it, email us. I'd rather give you the product for free than to have you taking it from this guy and supporting this person who's stealing from people. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't stop it. Um, you can't live your life that way I've tried and it's just got wrenching soul destroying. Yeah. It's just, yeah, you can't stop sense. piracy. I have a joke. I have a joke I want to share with you guys. Okay. There's an Asian comedian that I saw on Facebook. So somebody who recognizes who this person is, you guys can mention in the comment below. Tell me who this person is. All right. He was talking about this and he's on stage. He's like, you know, I always wanted to be a superhero. Like America has the best superheroes. There's Captain America, you know, can't, I want to be like Captain China, but instead of a shield, I'm gonna just throw out pirated DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> and is it their actual real superpower? Is they actually finance Captain America's operation? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's enough. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> All right, okay. what other question we got, Greg? Got another another kind of multi-part question here, but I, I think it's a good one. Uh, this is from Cam, and Cam asks, "What are the different revenue streams from your site?" Is it just selling design products or are there affiliate and ad revenue as well? Um, so the, by far the main way that we're making money is by selling products. Uh, we also sell webinars. Webinars can be profitable. Um, we're considering getting into selling courses and having a, a, a course part of our site. Mm -hmm. um, and the other way is through partnerships with um, external sites. So for instance, Affinity um, started a small marketplace and we were invited to be one of the first people to sell some Affinity products on there. Mm. And um, that was a fantastic way to establish some credibility and also to um, sell a good amount of products to Affinity users. I encourage you to, to sell courses, man. That's how we, we build our business. I'd totally buy one. I saw that I saw and I, you know, I, I did the passive income for designers and sold it one time and it, 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 it did really well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you think I should do that? Huh? It's, it works. It works well. I think so. If you have any questions, you can ask me. I'll, I'm happy to share. Okay, cool. Okay. I'm reading comments here. So what else we got here? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to make make better sense of a couple. There, there's some good ones. Just, yeah, there's a quick question this. about Dover. Like, what is Dover? You guys mm -hmm. just type in whatever. I tell my son this. He's 12 years old. I said, you know, never ask dad a question you can just find the answer to just by typing on the internet. What is Dover? 
Just type it in. Dover Publishing, I put the link in there for you before I get all crazy on you guys, all right? Just try. There's no penalty for typing in <laughs> on Google unless you have, uh, what is that, the, the safety feature turned off and it turns out to be a weird porn site. Otherwise, there's no punishment for that. You know, just type it in. It's easy, man. <laughs> I, I want to be clear, too, like just to, to double down on the fact that um, don't, I am not saying to take things from Dover. I'm saying <laughs> Dover. <laughs> Dover, Dover has made a business out of selling things that I that are largely in the public domain. Yes. So they give you a they can kind of be some breadcrumbs on a trail to pursuing public domain images. Um, I'm not saying to take things from Dover. Dover <laughs> is a big business. That's not what I mean. He just got a cease and desist email. <laughs> That's going to be a fun email to read later today from Dover's <laughs> attorneys. You guys, if you ever go into a bookstore, you remember what those are? You know, there's things with paper and bound together with glue, and sometimes there are hardcovers and softcovers. Dover Publishing is basically, essentially, a clip art publishing company. They have everything, like from patterns to borders to old Roman drawings. I have a, a library full of Dover clip art, like animals, beasts, and dragons, and all kinds of things, uh, ornate uh, filigree and decorative elements. We have all that and it's just sitting in the other room. All right, that's what Dover is. And we're, we're not going to get sued by Dover because he was just saying, Dustin was just saying, if you want a clue as to what's in the public domain, just look at what Dover does because that's going to point you in the right direction. But I think the more practical... Two, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, and two, um, public domain images, people do make money in a variety of ways off of them, but Public domain images are very low hanging fruit. I mean, anyone can go Google public domain images, find some and not know for sure if it's legal and start selling them. So it's super um, low hanging fruit. It's hard to make a lot of money selling public domain images. Um, the, the only exception that I've experienced is the one where my friend Jason from Lettering Library was selling these very, very mm -hmm. rare old, old books that you could not find. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? What else we got? Yeah, we have another one about um, how to, you know, how did you start building your email list from from scratch? And then uh, a follow up to that is, how do you how do you keep it growing at, at a constant rate and, and keep people engaged? That's a good question. Um, well, when I started, so Creative Market, I had a day where my sales just went through the roof, and as soon as that happened, I realized that I needed to get these people that were customers to my own site, where I could market to them without competing against other people. And there was a small biography section where you could, you know, most people would say things like, I'm a designer and I love to drink coffee or something like that. And in, instead, I put something to the effect of um, visit retrosupply.co and get nine products free or something like that. And then I put a link to my site. So they would go to this page and then when they entered their email address, they would get nine free products. Um, that was the beginning of my email list. Um, so I do that. Um, I also have, I rank high in a variety of things related to retro design on SEO. So people that come to the site will get a pop-up um, or a variety of other ways that they see to get their email address. You got to remember the first time someone comes to your site, if you don't get their email address, there's a good chance they're never coming back. Mm. So you really want to get that. And people will say, oh my gosh, I hate pop-ups. People say that, but then when you look at the statistics of how well pop-ups do in getting email addresses, you see that as much as they say they hate it, they are using it. I think what people hate is people hate stupid pop-ups that have no relevancy to what they're doing. If you have a well-timed pop-up with something really interesting to offer people, um, people don't mind that. People are referring to annoying pop-ups when they say they hate pop-ups mm -hmm. is my, my theory. Yeah, I can vouch for that experience too. Like if I go to a site I'm genuinely interested in, I just enter it right away and then I'm on my, I'm on my way through it. But uh, if I don't know how I got there and I see a pop-up, just get me out of here right now. Right. Or sometimes right when you get to a site before you do anything, a pop-up happens and you're like, I'm just trying to, to look at this thing. Get out of my way, pop-up. Yeah. Like I hate you. But if you get through an article about like some cool design and then it's like, hey, do you want to get all the stuff we used in this design for free? and a pop-up comes up, you might be like, yeah, I do, you know? Totally, yeah. So it's all about relevancy and timing, I think. Okay, okay, I think that's most of the questions, right, Greg? I think so, Is it yeah. time? You have one more. Jonah, do you have a burning question on, on what we've talked about thus far? I do not, uh, well, maybe 
like the, the actual terms of the agreement. Like, uh, you said that someone made like a hundred thousand, or someone made uh, that you collaborated with uh, twenty thousand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's partners. your question? Uh, how much? Like, is it still ongoing, or was that a flat fee? Like from the project. Yeah, that was both. So we had this person do some work where we paid them a negotiated fee, and then we also did uh, a webinar with him where we split sales with him. Okay. Okay, I got I have one more question All here. Right. Um, and this is from, from Bertram at the dig a little ways back. Um, Bertram asks, uh, when releasing products online and selling, um, what made you decide to go with a, a kind of business or brand name versus uh, your, your own name, so Dustin Lee? Yeah, um, well, you've got to remember, before I started Retro Supply, I was working for a business that essentially consulted people on making solopreneur businesses, businesses with just one person running it. And uh, I had seen hundreds, maybe thousands of people had been in these courses that they paid good money to be in these courses. And the, the outcome was you take this course and when you're done with the course, you end up with a business, ideally, um, a solopreneur business. And what we would find time and time again is that people would get stuck on very, very early things. You would think they get stuck on idea, but they would get stuck on domain names. They would get stuck on the colors for their site. So when I started Retro Supply, got to remember my situation here. I had a little girl on the way. I had two hours a day, maybe three hours a day max to work on this business. And I didn't have time. If I just said Dustin Lee, people wouldn't know what that was. I wanted people to have a really good idea of what I was selling from just seeing the name. Mm-hmm. So I thought Retro Supply. I think most people can make a pretty educated guess on what the shop is going to be <laughs> right. when they see that name. So I named it that. It was it was a name I came up with maybe in 15 or 20 minutes, like while I was drinking coffee, doing other stuff. And then the business grew. And then at some point, <laughs> you've dug your you've dug you've entrenched yourself, you know? So, so that's what, that's what it was called. Um, but that's why I named, that's why I named it that also, like, I don't think of myself as just someone that just loves retro stuff. Um, I do love retro stuff, but I don't know if I want to associate my entire name with that for the rest of my life. Right. It's a big commitment forever. Yeah, (laughs) it is. Yeah. What you've done is you've intelligently figured out how to do SEO Because if you're on creative market, there are tens of thousands of products or companies making stuff. And I don't remember Dustin, but I remember I'm looking for that retro or vintage thing. And I type that in, it's going to pop up. Mm -hmm. So people are not typing in, I'm looking for that Dustin thing or that Lee thing. It just doesn't work. So I think that's a good thing that you're doing. And it allows people to immediately associate a visual or an idea or a feeling just by hearing the, the, the name. Right. Right. And that totally. works from a brand messaging point of view. I have two questions. They're not easy questions. The first question I want to ask you this before we wrap up today. Question number one is on average, how much are you earning a month? Can you tell me that? Like um, earning, like not not like like profit, not revenue, because I don't know how many thousands of partners you have or yeah. payouts that you're doing. Gosh, it, it varies. Um It really varies. I, I would say anywhere from twenty to seventy thousand dollars a month. Well, that's a big <laughs> range there. So you have like uh, crazy sales periods, like probably in November, Black Friday ish, maybe. Yeah. Well, for instance, like November was like this record-breaking month. I mean, it was insane. Yeah. So I mean. Like lots, like that month we did really good. Every mm-hmm. year around that time we do really good. Mm-hmm. There's also slow months, you know. Um, but this past year it's really it's really gone up. So I don't know. I guess I'd say on average thirty to forty grand. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing forty grand a month, that's four hundred eighty thousand dollars that he is earning, earning, doing a passive income business, selling creative things that most people would just like. Well, who would buy that? Well, he's giving yeah. you 480,000 reasons why people would yeah. do that every single year. So that's a pretty nice, healthy profit for you. Good job. And can I ask how old you are now? 37. Wow. Look at that, you guys. 
Woo! Jonah and Greg have just left the building. They're going to launch their passive income business model right now. <laughs> I, Making templates and brushes. Not, yeah, you're like, who cares about this cut? <laughs> I, I, I should, uh, yeah. I should um, clarify a misconception a lot of people have. So again, just like Retro Supply, the name was came up with quickly, as you can imagine, because it's such a horribly long name, Passive Income for Designers was a name I came up with in five minutes when I was putting down a domain because I was going to start a business. I'm, I'm just really a big, a really big believer in getting things out the door and moving forward. And passive income is not the best word for what this is because yeah, people do make things and then just make money without doing anything for months or years on end. But I love this business, although it brings in money and I don't have to work on each individual product. I spend every day an amount of every day working on this business. I'm engaged in this business. I'm, I'm. Com- uh, invested in my customers. So I'm not just sitting here watching Netflix or riding my boosted board around. I mean, I'm, I'm working every day. Wait a minute. Don't, don't shatter the dream, man. Hold on. Hold on. Cause the last <laughs> question I was going to ask you what is what's a day like for Destin Lee, a guy who has no clients, who just makes whatever he wants who talks to his audience and, Oh, I'll send you a box of goods today. What's, what's a normal <laughs> day? Like, what do you get up? What are you doing? Just give us the highlights. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you have kids? I have two. Okay, cool. What do you What do you got? Boy, boy. I have two girls? boys: a 15 year old okay. and a 12 year old. Oh, okay, okay. So you've been through all this. So mm-hmm. I wake up. I go to bed to just me and my wife. I wake up with one to three children in my bed. <laughs> I go downstairs. I make myself some coffee. I uh, run. I go to this computer, and then um, a lot of it is meeting with partners and contractors to focus on products that we're making, that we're releasing. Um, A lot of it is checking in with people that work for me to find out what are issues that customers are having that we need to correct and make better to improve the products. Um, So yeah, I I spend a lot of time talking to people, talking to partners. Mm -hmm is what I spend a lot of time doing. And I know that's not the, the super exciting answer. I do go right out my boosted board. This past year, I said, if we met a certain revenue goal, I was gonna go buy a boosted board. So I do ride my boosted board uh, once or twice a day. That's cool. Um, but yeah. I, th- I think making $40,000 a month, I think you can afford to buy a boosted board. You can, you can live a little, man. <laughs> you could let yeah, it go. Well, Come on. Well, you know, you know, it's not just me living here. We got we got three kids. And we got uh, we got my wife, and of course, like, even though the business is doing well, you mm-hmm. know, taxes eat into a huge amount of that. Um, so when you were asking about like income, I was making, I wasn't counting. It's an LLC, and I pay myself, but. I still have to pay taxes on that. I wasn't including that. So right, right. Course, we're tax- talking pre-tax money. I mean, mm-hmm. come on. <laughs> yeah. It's still yeah, so tax is freaking crazy that. impressive. Come on. Doesn't like don't try to be humble about this. Come on. You're doing really well in life. You're doing almost a half a million dollars a year and it's growing, I assume. And you're doing all right. And you're living in Vancouver, Washington. You're 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 all right. You're all right. You're doing fine. <laughs> I appreciate that. I think I need to hear that more often. I think Call me every are- day. I will tell you you're doing great. <laughs> And you know, you know some sometime if you had the time, I would love to. Uh, I would love to hear your opinions on some things because, to me, it's so funny. You know, I look back on when I didn't have any money when I was really struggling to make mm-hmm. things work, and then now I look and by a lot of people's measures financially, they would say, "Oh, well, this person has been successful financially." But the, the funny thing is, is that it's two sides of the same coin. When you don't have money, you're constantly stressed about getting money. When your business starts to make money, you're constantly stressed about losing that money. Yeah. So it, it feels almost the same in a very weird, twisted way. Okay, can I say something? <laughs> Let me say something to you guys. We're looking right down the barrel for all you guys here. I've been thin, fit, and I've been fat. It's much better to be thin. I've been poor, and I've I have money. It's much better to have money than it is to be poor. So whether or not you're looking at the same side of the fence, you got different kinds of problems. The most difficult thing that you're struggling with right now is how to be present in the moment, right? When you're poor, you're worried about being poor and not having money and worrying about all the things that is not here yet. And now that you have money, you're like, is it all going to go away? So the difficulty in life is just to be happy, to be content, and look at things for what they are. There's a test. People always ask this question, right? And you've heard this before. It's a cliche. There's a glass, and it's kind of filled up halfway. 
and they're like, well, what do you see? Somebody might say, well, it's half empty. That's the pessimist speaking, right? The optimist looks at the glass and says, well, it's half full. And then the Zen master looks at the glass and the water and says, it's just a glass with water. It has no opinion. It doesn't care what your opinion of it is. It just is. And that's what we have to learn. We have to learn just to see things for what they are and remove the lens in which we look at the world because we realize so much of what we feel and experience in life is based on our individual reality and not physical objective reality. So you're doing fine, my friend, and don't worry about it. You come from nothing, you can go back to it and you can rebuild everything again. So just learn to live the life that you have because tomorrow you can get hit by a truck and you're like, why did I worry about losing all the money? Why did I worry about that? Then you could be happy and fulfilled with whatever it is that you have. It is time now for me to do the show recap before we say goodbye to everybody. I want to do the quick summary here. It's kind of a funny summary today, guys. Here we go. One, use birth control if you want to avoid unexpected surprises. <laughs> okay. Use birth control. The number one thing. What's that? Who wrote I wrote this. <laughs> Okay, you want to wake up a little bit earlier every day if, to squeeze in a few extra hours to work on your side hustle. This is if you have a full-time job. You need to do this. You can cheat life and just squeeze out a little bit more, sleep a little less, mess around a little less, and get stuff done, okay? Secret of life, especially if you're making products, is to ask your audience, what do you want? And then you have to do the difficult thing, which is to listen to them and give it to them. There's a lot of what we call, what is that confirmation bias that we have, that we already believe something, so we phrase the question wrong, and no matter what somebody says, we have our happy ears on, and then we just do what it is that we want. We totally ignore what it is that we, what people tell us to do. Next, profile your favorite designer artists and make tools that they might use. This is a great thing, because now you know who your audience is, and it's a good way to build a relationship with somebody. That leads us to partner and collaborate with people who have a bigger following. At the beginning, it is hard to build an audience, but anything worth having is difficult. It's not easy to do. So what you want to do is find somebody that you can collaborate with. And how do you do that? Exchange value for their time, for their audience. You have to give them something that they would appreciate and value. That's it. Develop your own site and audience to avoid cannibalization. It inevitably happens. The market gets flooded. People hear about the success that Dustin Lee's having. They're going to create more products. They're going to like, well, I know how to make that. I'll do that. It becomes harder and harder. You need to move those people over and build your own audience. You do not depend on others to help you make a living. Okay? And to realize you can't stop piracy. And the last and most important point is steal from Dover <laughs> Publishing outright. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right. So before we say goodbye, I want to thank everybody. Thank you for making it all the way to the end of this really long and informative live stream with us, with myself, Greg, uh, Jonah, and Dustin. Go ahead and reward yourself by hitting like, adding a comment, and hitting that bell to, to get notifications. We love you guys that are sustaining members. Here's how you get in touch with Dustin from Retro Supply Company. His name is Dustin Lee. He's the white Dustin Lee. At Hello Dustin Lee. That's how you reach him on Twitter. And at Retro Supply on Instagram, I believe. And the super long, crazy, complicated URL. If you want to check out more about his courses and how he's built a passive income for designers, well, it's passiveincomefordesigners.com. Also, go check out RetroSupply.co. There's some really cool things, super affordable. And if you have to have it all, get the have it all box. That's it. Dustin, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate having you here, man. Thank you. Yeah! Thanks, guys. Good stuff. Let's get out of here and let me play some music. Let me do my robot.